Right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode nine of the Total Hockey Training Podcast. And before I introduce my next guest, I just want to remind all the listeners that trainheroic.com, my program is Total Hockey Training. We are currently in the preseason phase and we'll be ramping up the in-season phase pretty soon. Again, you can get on for free for seven days and it's $39 a month and you can have access to me and my year-round hockey training program. Our next guest is Pete Friesen. He currently lectures at universities, mostly in schools of physical therapy. His interest is fascia, neurology, marginal decay. I want to ask him more about that. Pelvic floor. He teaches post-grad courses on dry needling. He's still training various athletes around the area, and he's getting ready to run his the New York City Marathon. And basically, I call him Pistol or or Pete, um, Push Up Pete. But more importantly, he's a friend and a mentor to me for over twenty three years now. Pete, thank you so much for coming on. It's my privilege. It's an honor to, to actually even spend time with you. And I'll tell you something. I just listened to your little intro, and I'll tell you something. That at that price to get uh, access to your information, your knowledge, your experience, uh, that's a, a no-brainer for me if, I, if I'm a hockey player or an athlete in general. So, oh, uh, thanks for saying that. Yeah, and that's it's great. True. Yeah, so uh, just tell us about yourself. I mean, I, I know all about you, but maybe some listeners don't. But I think you're a guy, you know, for me, you've always been – someone who I looked up to in terms of you're always positive and full of piss and vinegar and energy and and your, your passion just comes out of you so naturally. So tell us about yourself. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, honestly think a lot of times uh, if you ask any of my old athletes, uh, that's what they'll say. Uh, They won't uh, tell you how much, you know, my knowledge base or, you know, innovative exercises or anything like that. All they can usually remember about me is uh, uh, my energy uh, and what I brought to it. And I honestly think that, uh, uh, that that's extremely important attribute, not just for an athlete, but also for anybody in in, uh, uh, in exercise or in sports, probably in any uh, area of life is to have that same type of energy or passion uh, for whatever you're doing, because it rubs off. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you something. I, I was out for a run the other day and uh, uh, a guy stopped me and says, hey, you're giving me motivation. And this was a young guy, maybe 40 years younger than me. And, you know, in that him stopping, taking the time to tell me that I've motivated him actually motivated me. So it perpetuates itself, that passion and, and uh, enthusiasm for what you're doing. So uh, uh, I, I think that that's one of my mainstays. And I know uh, people like to be around that. So uh, I try to hone that attribute of mine and uh to this day still i'm very passionate uh about what i do uh in the area of wellness and uh uh just uh performance and prevention uh sort of thing but yeah love it i love it yeah you you've always been someone who you know you were the athletic trainer for the hartford whalers then the carolina hurricanes and you always had you had a lot going on you had you you were passionate about strength and conditioning you were passionate about massage therapy physical therapy how are you able to kind of handle all that um information coming in and how are we able to manage your day-to-day in that regard um well well, one i was very you know i think it all leads into one another right like a good strength coach is going to make a good physio it's going to make a good trainer going to be and then the more you know uh the better you're more knowledge based uh, the better you're going to be at all of those things and so you know, I'll tell you something. I got my start in hockey 43 years ago this fall, 43 years ago. So that's more than a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, I started with the Prince Albert Raiders and I was very blessed, I think, uh, to start in junior hockey uh, in northern Saskatchewan with the Raiders. We went on to win back to back championships, national championships in junior A hockey. Actually, the first season I was there, there was a fellow by the name of Nick Chelios in the league. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it, it was a good league. It still is a good league where a lot of NHLers that when they were developing their career, they would play hockey there and then they'd go on to a college career. But anyways, when I got that job, I was fresh out of university and uh, with the Prince Albert Raiders. And there was a coach who spent some time in the NHL. His name was Terry Simpson. And I actually owe my career to him because Terry, he was so blessed. He, he was financially a wizard. He made an awful lot of money in junior hockey. 
but he hired me as the trainer. I didn't, I was never a hockey player. Uh, I was a football player. I was a, you know, a cardiovascular type athlete and, and things like that. But he hired me. And uh, not only did he allow me to be the equipment manager for the Prince Albert Raiders, but he allowed me to be the trainer, the physio, uh, the bus driver. And uh, uh, so all of these roles. And so I had a long range. And so every step I took, I actually decreased a role. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like when I went from the Prince Albert Raiders to the University of Saskatchewan, I no longer had to uh, drive bus, mm-hmm. but I was still in charge of equipment. But what the reason why I'm telling you that long story is that's why I think uh, as I progressed up the steps uh, towards the NHL, uh, I carried many hats and I had a wide range of abilities. And I, I thought, uh, you know, more is better uh, sort mm-hmm. of thing. It makes you more employable. But also to this day, Sean, and, and maybe you can correct me too, but I think I'm the only person um, in pro sports, whether it's Major League Baseball, football, basketball, or hockey, that's carried those four hats. Uh, and especially for 21 years in the NHL, like the, being the head trainer, uh, the head strength coach, the massage therapist, physical therapist. I did, but it, one, also, it also came at an expense. I didn't have a lot of family time. And now, uh, Looking back, but you can't ever look back, right? Uh, right. But I have a lot of off time because, as you know, in the NHL, the uh, the summer is when you really have an opportunity to make a change in yeah. people's fitness levels. And so um, uh, I was kind of busy, like from once, the, uh, you know, exit medicals right into the summer and then back into the season. And, uh, but, um, uh, you know, one thing is my family all kind of in was involved in the whole process. Like my wife, God bless her. She, she was enthusiastic about the sport. My kids, actually, my oldest kid now is uh, the physical therapist for the Denver Nuggets. Yeah. So he kind of followed in the, uh, uh, my trade sort of thing, albeit for a lesser sport. Um, well, I, I, I was going to talk about that. I think that's unbelievable. Now, is that the same son who would go to the combine with you? It, no, it wasn't. That wasn't, guy okay. Being a lawyer. <laughs> yes. uh, he said, so, I don't want to do this, Dad. <laughs> no, no, he's still very, uh, honestly, intentive and intuitive uh, towards statistics, sports statistics. And I thought he was going to go into be, and he might still uh, into being a sports agent. So he's very okay. passionate about sports. He knows more about the NHL, junior hockey, but all sports sort of thing. No, it was the other guy uh, who always came to all my all the sports conferences with yep. me. Uh, yep. sort of thing he's my oldest kid uh is uh the guy that works for the nuggets now no he did he also work for the patriots in some capacity he did yeah yeah That's as a, a a therapist and um as i and i i've got you know i never saw an nfl game until he was uh the physio for the uh um uh, with belichick and the new england patriots and so that was pretty exciting eh? to go to your, your first yeah. football game and actually get the underneath you know, the back door, uh, you know, getting onto the field, you know, into the training room and things like that. That was pretty exciting. But uh, uh, his wife is from Denver and they had some family issues, but they actually had to move back to Denver. And luckily enough, he got on with the Nuggets and his yeah. first year there, they won the championship. So sure uh, he's did. been around winners all the time. That's that's unbelievable, especially go from the Patriots culture. You know, it is what it is. And then to the Nuggets and win a championship, that's got to be, he's got to be feeling pretty good about himself right now oh in, yeah his career his profession uh, and not only that though and I, not that this isn't part of the the podcast but he actually started out as being my stick boy uh with the uh the carolina hurricanes and he was right on the ice um when uh we won the cup like he yeah. was probably the first stick boy maybe i'm lying uh to hold a cup up uh andrew ladd gave him the cup uh when we were on the ice you know in that celebration yeah, that's pretty cool yeah, so uh, that that is kind of a neat thing for him to experience all of those winning cultures. Uh, sort yeah. Of so yeah, he's a serial winner. That's great. That is that's phenomenal. So talk about that. You mentioned I see the Stanley Cup in your background. Um, it's really cool. I remember that team, the two thousand six Carolina Hurricanes, and I was working my I think my third season for the Ducks then, and we ran into uh, the Edmonton Oilers and Dwayne and Dwayne Rollison and Chris Pronger. And they got to play you guys in the finals. What was that like to uh, to experience that with the guys and be a part of that? You know, uh, and you, you can speak to this too. You're a Stanley Cup winner, and uh, what, uh, what almost everybody I've talked to about it, it, it 
it really wasn't about hoisting the cup up at the end of the uh, season or the, that game seven sort of thing. It, what I remember most about it is all the trials and tribulations that we had to go uh, to get to that point. And mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. I remember, you know, like an episode like was almost like yesterday where uh, in February of that year, uh, we were uh, uh, really way out uh, in the lead with the points and stuff like that. And uh, one of our, the, the highest scoring forward in the NHL at that particular time, his name was Eric Cole. He runs into the boards head first. Somebody actually pushed him uh, mm -hmm. from behind, which was an extremely dirty hit, fractures his neck. And so now, because we weren't used to being that elite in the NHL, we lose our best player. And so that raised all kinds of trials and tribulations sort of thing. Um, with our best player going down with a broken neck. And as you, you like, who knows, you know, yeah. you hope for the best uh, and stuff like that. But uh, anyways, I remember incidences like that. Uh, I remember um, uh, after, uh, I think the second game uh, of the series, we we're playing Montreal Canadians and, and our starting goaltender, his name was Gerber at the time. I don't know if you ever ran into him, but. Oh, Marty, he, Marty Gerber. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he actually carried us throughout the season, uh, having a phenomenal season, but uh, that particular, he, he got the flu. And I remember our general practitioner trying to get an IV into him 13 times. They poked him and each time they did his vein would collapse. And so they couldn't get water in him. And he, you know, uh, and so he was dehydrated. He entered the game dehydrated, maybe five to 10 pounds. I learned a big lesson then, man. Yeah. You don't put your starting goaltender in a, a game. But anyways, uh, uh, you know, little incidences like that. That's what I remember, what people had to play through. You know, I remember like so many little things that the injuries and, and the, you know, the stressful situations that you get into and how you, you know, a winning team, a winning culture finds a way to, to succeed. You know, that next man up sort of thing with Marty, it was Cam Ward. Cam Ward went on to uh, have a stellar playoff and actually bring home the Stanley cup for us sort of thing. So, and we were very fortunate throughout that whole thing too, because we remained extremely healthy uh, yeah. throughout that whole time. Cause I remember, you know, it, as you know, it's tough uh, yeah. get, getting through Buffalo. We're like we were down, uh, three games to one to Montreal. We had to come back against Montreal. We had to come back against Buffalo. Uh, so it was just those little things are the exciting things that I'll carry with me from my whole life with regards to that Stanley Cup team. That is awesome. Yeah, you talked about that. You remember those moments or maybe it's a game where you kind of felt like things turned around for the, the team and the culture. You know, maybe it was someone got injured and the team responded and won a game they shouldn't have won and then they just got in a roll or something like that and you mentioned that the injuries like yeah you get to that point in the season it's guys are playing through whatever they possibly can because they do not want to miss out on anything i remember we had a um a sports hernia injury one of our players in 07 and this guy has sports hernia surgery and he's back playing for us in four weeks he's on he's texting the doctor uh, the surgeon out of Philadelphia is texting him every day. You know, what can I do here? What can I do here? Working with me, our athletic trainer. He's back on the ice in a month. He might, he might've missed. I, I mean, a, a round and a half of playoff hockey that he's back playing with his teammates. Like that's what you get. And, you know, you can say, well, well, that's really not safe, but when it's up to the individual player and what they're playing for, sometimes, they're, they're willing to do whatever, all the time, I should say, they're willing to do whatever it takes to win that Stanley Cup. And that's how it goes, right? Yeah, I totally agree. You know, going back to that Eric Cole um, uh, injury with his uh, fractured neck, um, I remember uh, we were in game four or five, or game five in Edmonton. And uh, so we've been rehab. I've been rehabbing him all, all this time sort of thing. And I've been doing it is bag skates and and uh because i got to right i was a strength coach i was a physio and something so uh, i got to monitor all aspects of his training anyways in game five uh he, he deems himself fit enough to go back to play and uh, i go holy shit man like i've been training i've been with you every day i don't think you're fit enough to go back into an nhl game six or game five uh of the playoffs in, in the the last series uh but anyways, we had a meeting of the minds. We had a doctor from Duke that was there. We had the players um, uh, doctor uh, from, uh, I think his name was Watkins, uh, a Duke specialist for spine. We had the coach. We had his agent. We had everybody in one room. We all took a vote, right? 
but who's uh, can this guy go back to play? Well, you know, I thought I was kind of, you know, big part of this because uh, I, I with him, I, I, I knowing a little bit more about all aspect of his rehab than everybody put together. Uh, anyways, we took a vote and I was the only guy that said, no, this guy is not ready to go back uh, for game five in, in uh, no, it was game six. It doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. anyways, uh, uh, anyways, everybody else said, so guess what? He was in the lineup. But one thing that I, I really appreciate, and I don't know if you've ever worked with Peter Laviolette, but Lavi, as we were oh. exiting that, that meeting, he said to me, he says, Pete, I know that you don't want this athlete to play but I'm the guy that has to put my name on the, uh, the, the sheet that puts these guys into the game. And that's on me. It's not on you. You've been hurt. Point being is I was just going to a little bit more of this story is that he, so not only did Eric Cole go to play, he was in the starting lineup. He was the starting six and uh, we were playing uh, Oilers and uh, right away he gets line drive right into the boards, man. Mm -hmm. And, um, Anyways, uh, I shit myself uh, because, uh, damn it, that's exactly what he's not used to is that heavy body contact that's in the playoffs. And, right. you know, it's notched up not only from, sure. you know, preseason to season to each playoff segment uh, sort of thing. And guess what? Eric Cole jumps up and says, you know what? It's going to take a lot harder hit than that to get me oh. out of this game. But like you said, these guys have played their whole lives to dream yeah. of winning the Stanley Cup. And, you know, and I, I'd be like, we're lucky, right? We won the Stanley Cup. Our names are on that cup. There's a lot of great players, a lot of great strength coaches, a lot of great trainers that never get their name on that. So I feel blessed, but also, you know, just going back to what they all play with. And, and that's what uh, uh, my little story about that Stanley Cup playoff, too. But there's really hundreds good. of them, as you can imagine. That, yeah, that, absolutely. And that's so cool. Like you said, it, it's the appreciation and the memories and all that. And then you always have your name's on the Stanley Cup. That's really cool. And that's really special. No, yeah, no, no doubt. Um, so talk about, talk about, you know, you, you mentioned Eric Cole, you spent a lot of time with them rehabbing them and, and talk about those relationships you have with players, like how important it is. You know, I remember, for example, um, I spent a lot of time, I, I couldn't even skate before. And we had Francois Beauchemin who had a torn ACL and we didn't have a skating coach at the time. And I said, I'm going to get on the ice and skate with them. And just, I got skating with them and we, we had a great relationship, still friends. Our, our sons became good friends in hockey and everything. Talk about your relationships with some of your players. I know um, you're pretty close with uh, Rod and uh, his condition and his strength training, which is phenomenal. Like talk about some of your personal connections you've had with players through the, the rehab and the training process. Uh, you, you know, I, I read a recent statistic or a paper that said that most uh, patients or athletes, they don't care how much your knowledge is or whatever, uh, your knowledge, your, your uh, experience, what they care about mostly for your success is whether they trust you mm -hmm. uh, and whether you can relate, communicate with them. That's the number one thing that you need with your athletes. And if you can't do that, it doesn't matter if you're the best coach in the world. If you can't communicate, if they don't trust you, you're not going to be effective, but you know, it's, and this kind of maybe uh, doesn't quite answer, but I still remain good friends with Zidino Chara uh, because uh, I trained him as a junior hockey player. And so I made the NHL before he did, but <laughs> in Edmonton, I, I trained him for two of his junior years and uh, we've kept, you know, close contact ever since. Uh, and it's been amazing, right? Uh, yeah. Because again, uh, I can see his development and what he thought of with base training that he did with me throughout his, you know, stellar uh, NHL career. So uh, we still have a bond to this day, even though we, it developed, you know, uh, 25, 26 years ago, I don't a long time ago, uh, sort of thing. So that's, but most of my, you probably know this, uh, I think that uh, I don't keep in touch with many of my athletes to be honest because there's mm -hmm. been thousands of them but yeah. the ones i do there's a bond and a trust but i think even the ones that you don't uh they they know that i've always had their best interests in hand i i believe and they also yeah. would say that you know one i was enthusiastic and then two uh i always wanted to learn to get better uh for them and so if they had a problem uh i would find and then not only that uh to treat not only them but anybody else, and I, I learned that, and you probably did in a, a, a pro locker room, it's maybe worse today because of Google. Dr. Google, we used to call it. Because, yeah. it, But uh, you, you'd have to deal with that, but also their family uh, and stuff like that. And so uh, that was really important that I established those connections uh, with my athletes in the room. Uh, but in any aspect, even summer training with my guys, that you know, they came from other teams. 
Yeah, no, that's that's cool. And I'm the same way. I mean, I, there's a couple guys who I still stay in touch with and, and some guys who I don't. And maybe some guys it's because, you know, you, your job is a, as a strength and conditioning coach sometimes is a little bit harder with the fact that, hey, you got the, the hammer coming down from the coach or the GM saying, hey, this guy is out of shape. You know, what are we doing with him? So you can become a thorn in their side. But that being said, I've always loved it when a former player of mine may have, may have came by the, the locker room or see me walking out after a game and saying, hey, thanks for everything. You were right. So, yeah, it, it, I, I really like that. And, and that was that was a lot of fun to experience that and develop those relationships and, and see see players grow. You know, as you know, you, you don't have your the same players on the same team every year. They come and go. They go to different teams. So it's nice to have that connection. Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. And th that's that's what's valuable about the job. It's not the wins and losses, but those relationships you develop along the way, sort of thing. And not just with their players, but uh, uh, but with the wives and, and uh, yeah. their families and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it, and you know yeah. what though, uh, Sean? To be honest with you, I think that's changing now in the league. I, I don't think that trainers, strength coaches have the same relationships like we used to have when we started out. Personally. No. I, I would say that, you know, the game, the game has changed in that regard. It's the, I don't know if it's the generation of the athlete you look at, it's tough because you're looking at, you know, 23 individual organizations with, within one team. Right. And it, it's tougher in today's, today's game with the salary cap and, and, but like you said, like winning that Stanley cup is hard. It's not to, it's it's very very hard and it's not every is 32 teams now in the league only one's going to win it and you know a lot of times it's you don't win the stanley cup it's an unsuccessful season so it, it's a lot of different dynamics and all that so that's interesting um so yeah talk about talk about you know what you're doing now your family and and you know what what are your what are your what's your goals for right now? I know you probably have a ton on your plate and love to hear about it. Well, you know, uh, my, honestly, it really has never changed from the NHL to now sort of thing. I, I, I still have a, I'm a keen, um, for learning and knowledge. And like the one term that I brought up, uh, the marginal decade. And, yes. uh, I, I don't know if, if you haven't heard that term, that, that means in the realistic terms of it. But, uh, and I think that a guy by the name of Peter Atia quoted it. And if you haven't read his book, Outlive, you should. Okay. Uh, but it's all about prevention and wellness. But he talks about the marginal decade, which is the last 10 years of your life. And so what you want to do is to prepare yourself as well as possible for those 10 years of life until you live until you're dead, not mm -hmm. die while you're living. Uh, you know what I mean? It's that we're knowing now, and, and especially I came from a, one of my universities I graduated from, they had the longest, longest longitudinal uh, study on growth and development in the world. So I'm pretty up to speed on that. And they still have it going on. It's been going on for about 40 years. But, you know, the information coming out about older people is, is so full of problems and, and uh, misinformation. It's, it's not even funny in the fact that I think just like a lot of our athletes, we we expect more of them, and, and but they don't give it to us. Same with elderly people. And when I mean elderly people, that people are maybe in their 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s or 100. You know, we don't expect enough out of them, and we should change our expectations. So the marginal decade, how? And personally, next on November 5th, I'm going to run my first marathon ever. Awesome. And so, uh, yeah, and as you know, like I do, uh, you know, 600 push-ups a day. Now yep. I can. Uh, I actually compete some, uh, like I cover still at state wrestling tournaments and things like that. There's a lot of college wrestlers that can't do as many push-ups as I can. Point being is that I'm getting ready. So when I am in my eighties, when I am in my nineties, I'm going to still be running marathons. That's my focus on, but you know, the only thing is how can that relate back to your podcast? Well, I think that what you, we need to do is that, you know, that marginal decade I talked to you about the last 10 years of your life. Well, I'll tell you something. If you got a guy in the NHL and he's in his twenties, his marginal decade in the pros might be in his thirties. We got to convince yeah. him on a lifestyle that's actually going to enhance his next 10 years of life sort of thing, or when they're in their teens, there's no better time to start this kind of philosophy as early as possible. I wish I would have started, you know, more training and conscious eating and things like that, because 
honestly, I'm running better now. I just saw on my, I, I have this Apple watch. I'm not bragging, but I got one of those uh, uh, Apple watch twos or something. They give mm -hmm. you all the things. I can run at 90% of my maximum heart rate for 40 minutes. I don't know of many people that could ever expect that of a wow. person my age. You know, not only that, I've run my fast is five and 10k times now at 66 when than when i was in my 50s so i gotta be honest this shit is real we yeah. just got to expect more of ourselves and train for that marginal decade and the training for it, what peter atia calls backstaging so we got to really emphasize that backstaging but you can see how you know what he's talking about with elderly i would talk about that with my young people and it transfers through decade all decades of your life uh sort of thing even to this day i don't train my guys and i'm training some guys that are uh 78 72 years old and, and they're doing phenomenal things one guy's a level five kayaker open ocean kayaker at 76 i don't know if you know what that means but they can go six miles off the ocean coast and be in 12 foot waves in a kayak well it's not my cup of tea but this kid's 76 years old he just tore his rotator cuff, but that was piss poor training in his 60s and 50s. He's back coaching and teaching that level, that uh, level of kayaking now. And he had his surgery in June. That's awesome. So, uh, so th that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of dry needling too. And uh, I'm teaching that sort of thing. So that's what you know I'm, I'm fascinated about because it modulates the, the nervous system, the sympathetic and the autonomic nervous system. Um, and also the, you know, the only other thing that I was going to tell, I'm also fascinated like with the feet. I don't think that as strength coaches and it behooves me. Remember when we were le learning SFM, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, SFMA and uh, functional movement screen, you yeah. know, we get guys to do overhead squats, but one thing that always kind of behooved me, why do they have their shoes on 99% of the time? Strength coaches never look at the person's foot. Um, Although it's the first thing to engage in the ground to create counteraction forces, we never look at that. So I'm sure. really doing a deep dive into training the foot and the individual muscles and things like that uh, as well. And applying it to my strength training, because as you can imagine, that's good for, you know, sprinters, world class, hockey players are worse because they, their foot muscles are terrible. Yep. But if you can keep those things intact. And I'm not saying really muscular, but control wise, uh, I think that you and I know it enhances your balance and performance. So, yeah, those are just some of the things that I'm into right now. I love it. That's that's awesome. That, that, that reminds me, my grandma, she uh, I think she passed away at age 95 and she had a bike in her apartment. She had a bike that she rode every day. Amen. You know, 20 to 30 minutes. And yeah, I think longevity is is whether it's. Um, combating sarcopenia or balance or stabilization we have to be able to live as long as we can in the in, into our fullest potential yeah exactly actually you know like the the oldest person uh that to uh, finish the hawaiian marathon this year that was this year was 92 years old there was a a woman uh in october or when they did the hawaiian ma marathon uh, uh, triathlon um she was uh 78 this woman finished the, the Ironman in Hawaii. And you know what that is. That's a five mile open ocean swim followed by a 120 mile bike ride. Finish it off with a marathon. She was 78 and she finished a half hour below the record. They put you off the course at 12 hours. Anyway, she finished 11 and a half hours. They are interviewing and said, well, you know, how come it took you 11 and a half hours? What happened to this lady? Her name was Harriet. Uh, I forgot her nice, but anyways, Harriet, she, she finished that five miles. So she got on her bike. She fell off her bike, fractured her clavicle. She actually hinged up her shoulder by herself with like some bandana and then went on to finish the marathon, uh, in 11 and a half hours. Now, if that doesn't get you fired up, you know what I mean? If right. that does that kind of experience doesn't fire up your athletes that are 20, that removes all excuses from training. So I'll tell you, so that's, that's kind of stuff that I agree. You know, you that brings music to my ears when you say your grandma was on a stationary bike. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's going to help give her more life to her years for sure. Yeah, that, that is that is awesome. Um, I want to talk about this. So <clears throat> you can already hear it, and you're 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 a forward thinker. You're a lifeline, a lifelong learner. You're always trying to get better. And I just want to mention this. I have in my email account. I have saved emails from people who I've emailed over the years. I got. Yourself, I got Charles Poliquin, even guys like Vern Gambetta, Mike Boyle. And I pulled up this email. This is September 25th, 2000, Pete. So 23 years, almost 23 years ago. And I I remember, I remember I, I must have stole someone's notes from um, 
a conference you spoke at probably with Scotty up in Montreal. Could have been, yeah. Yeah. And it's you you your presentation was on the foam roller. Do you remember that? Kinda. Yeah, yeah. Really. yeah. Like that, that's that's what's so so neat about you. Like the foam roller now, it's you know, I, I thought, you know, again, you're probably gonna think it's no big deal, but your forward thinking, the foam roller I didn't know anything about. And then I asked you a question and you responded with most of my ideas come from trial and error. Also what the athlete requires. I do incorporate the foam roller before and after practices, most of the stretching and mobilization before and the massage after. So I just, I just wanted to like, I, you know, I'm kind of crazy for saving those emails, but I don't know. I think it's pretty cool, but um, yeah, like that was, 23 years ago and you using the foam roller and i remember like now nowadays every nhl visiting locker room has to have four foam rollers provided in the nhl pa uh, agreement but also you know never mind the home the home facilities you know we had i don't know 40 50 rollers between our practice facilities and game arena it, it's become a a thing where like you like you were the only massage therapist in Carolina at the time but so how are you going to get your soft tissue work in you're going to use the foam roller and I think now it has become I'm not saying it's like earth shattering technology or whatever but it's a big part of the training process and I just want to point that out like you you kind of exposed me to the foam roller for the first time 23 years ago I think that's pretty neat wow. You got a good memory, uh, yeah. to be honest with you. but thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the other thing is I was probably lazy and that's why I wanted to introduce a foam roller to my boys <laughs> uh, because um, then I wouldn't have to uh, massage them. But uh, I did do an awful lot of massage. I remember back in the day with massage, I, I would take to about August for my elbows to settle down um, it, that, because I'd massage so much. Uh, and, the, the, you know, tennis elbow or golfer's elbow I'd get from massaging. You couldn't sleep at nights because they would just ache on you uh, sort of thing. But uh, that's a uh, time for another story. But uh, uh, not now. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, I do think that, you know, again, like you, you know, Sean, I, I consider you and I very similar in that we search out our mentors. You know, like you just talked about Charles and Vern. Those are guys that I hung around with, too. Like I talked to on a regular, and well, not uh, Charles so much anymore. Uh, I'm just kidding you. Uh, God rest yeah. his soul. Uh, but, um, you know, those are the people that I'd seek out. And, and, and you know, the other thing is I, I'm kind of known for is this quote uh, that uh, actually Mike Boyle comments on all the time is that I give people credit for two weeks that they taught me something. And then after that, uh, you know, it, it just becomes name dropping, right? Yeah. The point being is that, yeah, you know, where does plagiarism get off, you know, and come on in the fact that, you know, if you quote one person, uh, that's plagiarism. If you quote a bunch of people, well, that's research. Right. Uh, only thing is, uh, you know, and that's what's important about our industry. Hey, can I tell you, this is kind of a deviation, but that's where I find right now the research in fascia. Nobody gives a shit about fascia. So everybody's open to sharing it. You know, I mean, right. and that's why I love, you know, getting into the different, you know, um, uh, podcasts or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, mailings uh, on fascia because everybody's willing to share that stuff where, you know, if you get into sort of high tech strength and conditioning, because it's such a competitive area and there's so much money, nobody really wants to share that information anymore. And I right. think it really holds us all back when we don't share things. And so um, anyways, I, I've always been in my life, maybe because I started up in Northern Saskatchewan, I had nothing. I, I needed people to share with me uh, sort yeah. of thing. And so anyways, uh, um, yeah, that, that's all I had to say about that. But thanks for keeping that memo around. Yeah, I still have it. I, I, you know, I, I kept all those emails. I just had them in a file and a folder. And, and you know, those questions, you know, you know, asking Charles. And I'd, I'd get like a one-word answer back from Charles, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I always kept those. I still have those. I think it's pretty neat. And like you said, you know, I always loved to kind of, when I was a visiting team, whether it was you or visiting with guys like Matty Nickel or, or Scotty Livingston or, or um, you know, Lauren Goldenberg, who's going to be on the show. You know, I, I always enjoyed visiting with them and like, okay, what do you do when you have this going on? Or what do you suggest here? And it was kind of neat to kind of be that young guy when I first started. And then as I went on, guys are coming and knocking on my door to come meet with me and ask me questions. So it's just, it's just a process, you know? 
Yeah. You know, yeah. just like, you know, we were those young, well, I'm older than you, but we were those young guys at one time and then we progressed up and now we're those old guys, right? We're yeah. the Gambettas, the Charles Polquins uh, sort of thing uh, of it. And so it's, that's why it's even more. And I applaud this podcast that you're putting on because, you know, you're a library and for you sharing your information, your knowledge with with all of your podcast listeners, they're, they're, they, they're very lucky to have somebody that has your academics and your experience and knowledge. That, that makes you invaluable. And I'm glad to see that you're passing that down to other people. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. This is a this is a fun thing for me, and it's a good little project. And again, it allows me to you know visit with you. I haven't seen you in a couple of years and, and, and see what you're up to. And that's important to me. So So you're living in Raleigh still, and you love it down there? I love that area of the country. Yeah, I do. Especially this time of year. Uh, and not going back to this thing that I'm focused on November 5th. You know, that's the day I want to be a hero. Uh, <laughs> you know, as the song goes. But, you know, it, the the leaves here and the foliage. You know, people come from around the world to be here. It's a great environment. I'm still quite intimately involved with, uh, you know, on the sports medicine side of things with NC State, North Carolina State University. Sure. And so, um they, they've changed their program around where I kind of mentor some of their uh, student trainers. Uh, they're, well, they're, they're trainers, they're certified athletic trainers, but, uh, you know, they're trying to get uh, a sort of a fellowship there. And I'm in, involved with that program. And then plus, uh, I, uh -huh. like I said, uh, I teach at uh, some, some of the universities around here, but some of them like Arcadia, which is in Philadelphia. But as you know, with the pandemic, I do a lot of that stuff by, you know, like what we're doing right now is Zooming uh, sort of thing. But uh, yeah, um, that, that's what uh, I, I still love it down here. Albeit, you know what, I got to be honest, I, I would move back uh, to Canada, but my wife would never uh, sort of thing. But anyways, uh, that's a, a time for another story. But uh, she really loves it down here. But, you know, I also kind of like the winter sports. Hey, kind of like, you you know, like you got, I, I went to Bemidji yeah. State. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And, and so like, I like the ice fishing. I like the cross country. I like the downhill skiing. I like snowmobiling. All of those things are, th that's appealing to me. Uh, not so much my wife though. Uh, yeah. So anyways, <laughs> uh, that's uh uh, again, another story, but yeah, we're living life and, and you know, it's honestly, uh, this is the first time in my life I get to do everything I want to do, not what I have to do. And you, you know what that's, that's like. That's pretty neat. Yeah. That's yeah. good for you because you, you deserve all that. All that. Now uh -huh. tell me really quickly, um, you mentioned Canada, obviously. Talk to me about your, your love for the CFL. Oh, <laughs> hey. You know, I got, uh, that, I love it. You know, uh, I just tell you, like most people, I'm the only guy in my family, my immediate family that actually watches, see, we get better coverage down here all the time sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, a, I was raised and born a, a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan. Uh, you know how tough it is. They've only won four great cups. That's like, you know, the Stanley Cup in the NHL. They've only run four cups in their whole history, 100-year history. They've only won four. You know what's behooving about that? There's only nine teams in the uh, CFL. So, you know, the chances yeah. of them winning should be a little bit higher than us. But point right. being is that um, I got a chance this fall or this spring to go up and uh, train the uh, Winnipeg Blue Bombers training staff in dry needling. Oh, wow. I know. I guess goosebump again. <laughs> I know it's not the you know the you know uh, New England Patriots or anything like that, but it's the Blue Bombers, and they're like the class uh, of the league right now. They, their mm -hmm. winning legacy is being developed as we speak. They're that great. Uh, so, anyways, I got to go up there and meet them and see their facilities and stuff. So now I've kind of hedged over to being a Blue Bomber fan, oh. and. Uh, so just so you know, like all, if anybody knows me that's listening to this, they'll know, well, that's a surprise, but I got to be honest, that organization is stellar, starting right with the head coach, the head trainer, uh, those, oh, and also the, the, the head strength coach, uh, took the, the stuff from me too. So, uh, I was, you know, again, what I would like to have the encapsulated audience, there was only six of them. We started, we started at four o'clock in the afternoon. Because they had been up so like 5.30 in the morning taping and all the way down to 4 o'clock. And then we'd go to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to teach this dry needling for three consecutive days during camp. Wow. Well, I'll tell you something. That shows a little bit of grit right there from their training. Oh, yeah, absolutely it does. That Those are long days. Oh, my God. But anyways. Remember, that, yeah, the, the Rough Riders. Oh. We had a we had a player in our team, Ryan Getzloff. His brother, yeah. was, a, his brother was a right wide receiver for the team. His, I think his name is Chris. Talk about an athletic family, by the way. Um, and we we had a Sunday night game at home back in Anaheim, and the Rough Riders were playing for the the Grey Cup. 
and Getsy would, Getsy would come out of the locker room back to the weight room. And I, I remember a um, great guy, Sheldon Brookbank. He's a S- Saskatchewan guy. Yeah. He's into the, into the game and everything. And I remember you probably recall this. They lost the game because they had too many men on the field for the extra point attempt. Do you remember that game? I do actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was the game they lost. And that was kind of crazy how they lost, but I remember, I remember the energy and excitement about it. Cause I think Getsy's brother was playing in the game. Obviously he was checking in on him, like see how the score, what the score was, but that was a pretty big deal. And I, I think when they did win one time, I think Ryan like flew up there to be part of the celebration with his brother. I think that was pretty neat. Yeah, Getzlaff actually was a superstar in the league. Like, he was one yeah. of the best. He, he's a Hall of Famer in my mind uh, uh, going into that, if he isn't already. I try and keep track of that. But, yeah, he he was phenomenal. He picked the wrong sport, though. He would have made a hell of a lot more money if he would have went to the NHL. His brother? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, they they I, don't I get think, paid much at all. I think Ryan, talk about athletes, he's probably the – I don't know. It's It's a – a stretch but he's probably the best athlete pure athlete i've ever worked with i mean he they he he went over to angel stadium he's hitting balls out of the park like no problem because he was a catcher when he when he played young he, he could have been a pro baseball player whatever whatever sport he chose i mean luckily for everyone he chose hockey but he he would have been a professional at whatever ever sport he wanted to do yeah, it gets like, so his brother was phenomenal too. Yeah, good for them. But that's I I just want to touch on that because I know you're passionate about that, and I think it's pretty neat. Um, because it's a pretty good, it's a good league. I love the rules. I love you know this. There's, there's some rules up there that would be great in the NFL, like in my opinion. You know, like the 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 bigger end zone, for example, like that would make the red zone a little bit more, I guess. Depending on it'd be harder to defend, but hard, easier to score and get more points in the NFL. That, those things like that, for example, I think that would be beneficial. So I, I, I agree with you. And also like many people in motion, you know, it kind yeah. of reminds me of backyard football, you know, flag football, yeah. everybody's running towards the offensive line and it increases the chance of uh, <clears throat> of scoring. Hey, you know, the other thing I was thinking about, because, you know, uh, <clears throat> a lot of times we never think about equipment changes, right? You know, yeah. like when they started going to graphite skates from leather skates, I never saw that, you know, ski top uh, fractures, ski uh, boot fractures would become a thing. I think that's actually what lead, led the cause of, of sports hernias because the ankle couldn't dorsiflex or move as well. Same with wrist injuries with the graphite sticks. Uh, all of these things sort of project uh, future injuries. And so you got to really watch. You might know, you know, I remember when they went to a, a, a smaller cuff um, uh, elbow pad and that actually increased the number of uh, facial fractures. But what, what happens is right now in the NFL, yeah, well, you saw how many terrible injuries there were on the past weekend. Yeah. Not saying that, that, but maybe the field needs to be addressed. You know what I mean? Because maybe, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the end zone being so small, those players are so big. Just like in the NHL, the hockey rink size hasn't changed at all, but the players right. have all gotten bigger. And so they're faster. So maybe it's time to think about, re, you know, looking at the surfaces of both sports. You know what I mean? And yeah. whereas, like, as you know, in the uh, CFL, we have a much um, – the big thing about the comparison is in the CFL, we have a much wider, much longer field, but more importantly, Sean, we have bigger balls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> but anyways, I think, I, I think it's a great point. The sur- not only the surface area, but you're also seeing in the NFL specifically, they have less time to prepare. Like I don't get it. So they have a mini camp in I think May for a couple weeks, the coaches have limited time where they can work with the players you know, back in back in like the '90s, they used to have off-season strength and conditioning programs for like 15 weeks, from like January through May or June. Now they only have mandatory mini camps. Then they take about a month off, where the guys just can do whatever they want for a month. Then they come back for their training camp in July. Again, there's limited time where they can practice. It. I just. I don't. I don't think the physical preparation is anywhere near where it should be nowadays. And I, I could be wrong. I, I just, I think it's a little bit different now. Um, but I think certainly think the surface area is a part of that, especially when, you know, stadiums are are building, they're putting their turf down for the big soccer matches coming up. I think that that are coming up sometime and they're not really thinking about the football athlete. Well, the football athlete should be the one who's getting taken care of and put the soccer field in afterwards. I, maybe I'm wrong, but 
I think that's what's going on. But yeah, they just you don't want to you don't want to see the better players get injured. Like no one wants to see Aaron Rodgers be hurt for the rest of the season. You know, like that's that that's the reality, right? And so and it's the same in all sports. So yeah, it's kind of funny you'd say that. And just going back to my deal with the equipment, <clears throat> they analyzed this his running shoes even to the like first of all they were blaming it on natural turf or, or uh, turf versus grass and then they said no statistically there's no difference in uh, uh gas rock tears or achilles tendon tears and then they looked at their shoes and if you see on his right foot his right foot as he's going down can't dorsiflex very much and so what happens slams more rest uh resistance on his left foot and so then now they're blaming the shoe because it didn't bend in the same angle that the ankle joint bends in uh huh. sort of thing but you know, I'm just uh, Achilles tendon. Oh, that's another. I, again, I don't know where you point fingers, right? Because you got to point fingers. But the yeah. point being, a lot of times, what, and I'm just telling because I'm one. I'm a strength coach. A lot of times, we don't get that knee to go over the toe as far as possible. And so you say, "Oh shit, uh, that's really important." The recovery stride for a hockey straight uh, stride. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But also, when you're changing directions, your toe has got to go over the. That knee has to go over the toes. Knees over the toes, and if you don't train that. Chances are you're going to put more stress on the Achilles tendon, but the Achilles tendon anatomy is also, you know, there's a little watershed area where uh, there's no blood supply or very limited blood supply. And it's really diminished when there's any type of dorsiflexion. So that's why it's really prone uh, to tearing. But anyways, uh, you know, there's so many things that you got to question yourself with, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. uh, and, And then try and back, you know, backstage it to see why it happened. And I don't know if, you know, strength coaches or trainers and stuff like that do enough. There's a lot of finger pointing, but there's no, you know, come to a medical alliance. You know, like you said, with, when you had that abdominal hernia, you know, right. you, you worked with the trainer and stuff like that. That's intimate. You know, that medical alliance, honestly, and the different areas I've been in, it's getting really, there's borders being put up and the, there's communication. Is and and it, yeah. I, at the, uh, unfortunately, the athlete's the one that suffers. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen that many times because the athletes they want what's best for them and they have they have people coming at them from all different areas of life you should be doing this you should be doing that go see that guy it's a hard it's a hard deal now because the the players are going to do whatever they want to do as they should but you're always going to have these outside influences saying oh you should be doing that instead of this you know like that that's a hard it's a hard gig yeah you, you know how I get around that, though, personally, is that every time I, I always looked at it as a gift, I'd have my athletes come back in the fall and they were following ART or what was that electrical company that? Uh, oh, the ARP. ARP, uh, yeah. the ARP, uh, ART, ARP. And there's so many other things they'd come back with the new, new trends that they said, hey, man, this is going to get us the cup. We got to get everybody on this. And what I do is I do a deep dive as much and I get the team to pay for it, to send me to the courses and to get to know that as much as possible to see where there's shit or where there's a pony. You know what I mean? Because a lot of that stuff is just shit and uh, they're getting abused and their money just emptying their pockets. But sometimes I would pick a nugget up and and I would take it and apply it to the rest of the team. But also in the meantime, by doing that deep dive and the athletes knowing I'm doing that, they, they'd respect me more that oh shit you do know something about the arp you do know something about art uh, and you'd bet you i would and i yeah. would tell them the pros and cons and then it would i'd leave it up to them to make the right decision and 90 percent of the time it was the right decision in my mind and then you know what's great too they get they understood that you're going to figure out if it was shit or not yeah and trust you enough to believe okay pete says this is shit so that's it but I was the same way. Like I would like go deep dive, for example, active release technique. You know, we had a brilliant guy down the street from Anaheim, the, the, the Honda center. And I would just, I would me and the, and the trainer, we'd be like, Hey, listen, you know, we got to look into this. This guy is unbelievable. We'd have guys lined up to go see him every day after practice. And I had no problem with that. It only, it only made us look better because we were more healthy and these guys were getting activated and, you know, the active release technique provider supported us, you know, it was great. It was phenomenal. So there's situations like that all over. That medical alliance is imperative and I see it deteriorating, not getting stronger in most pro teams. Yeah. Uh, so I agree. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I go back to where, you know, people used to be so protective over their territories, like physical therapists, athletic trainers, chiropractors, strength coaches, and, 
they didn't want to share any knowledge. Right. Well, there's enough work for everybody to go around if you're, you know, good enough, smart enough, uh, energy wise to, to, you know, that you can stay in your area, but share it with other people sort of thing. And that also not only goes to those professions, but also like orthopedic surgeons, general practitioners, you know, like a lot of times they don't understand what the athlete's going through and you got to educate them. You got to take your time to educate them in a way that they'll trust you and understand. And that's same with the uh, hockey coaches too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've been blessed. I've only had a few really bad hockey coaches that I've had to deal with. Uh, but for the most of my career, they've all been stellar. As a matter of fact, I've only had one that was a real bad person uh, sort of thing. And there's no way getting through them. But you know what? Mental illness is a real issue uh, sort of thing. And, and so you got to also remember, you know, these guys are probably reaching out. The, they can't ask for help, but they, they need help. Um, oh, yeah. So it's, mental uh, illness, depression, that's a big deal. Oh, absolutely. It sure is. And yeah, it's... um. It sure is, and I think that there's more um, recognition of that um, up and down the chain, so that's good. All the time, yeah. Yeah. You know, the only thing is what I worry sometimes, and I'm just being selfish now, but a lot of times they look at the players and that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> but they don't look at the support staff, you know, whether it's management, whether it's the coaching staff or the training staff, support staff, they just focus on, and you know what, um, I, I think that they got to be more open, at least in our league. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Well, Pete, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I just want to say, you know, thanks for coming on. It was just great. Outstanding to see you, see you again and talk to you again. And just, I hope the listeners can just can, can feel the energy Pete gives when he's talking and his answers and his, you know, he's just awesome. And, uh, I miss, I miss seeing you around the rinks and everything, but, uh, this has been great. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, yeah, Sean, honestly, from my part, uh, it's been great catching up with you. And I really appreciate what you're doing for our profession by putting on uh, things like this podcast. So keep up the great work and hopefully our paths cross a little further down the way. Okay, buddy. Thank you. And I, 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 please let me know how you do in the marathon. You got it. All right, buddy. All right. <laughs> thanks, pal. Cheers. Bye. Take care.